there's a lot of things you know that go into that especially from the state side you know we do a lot of habitat management uh where we might um uh create you know vernal pools uh to uh to uh, create um amphibian habitat for breeding uh we may um what's a vernal you know, pool a oh, vernal pool uh that is uh, essentially it's a seasonal pool so it's a, a a pond uh that dries out during some point in the year generally over the summer uh and it's important for amphibians specifically because most um or a lot of amphibians prefer to breed in bodies of water that are fishless uh and a vernal pool you know is is just that place uh, because it dries out fish cannot uh, survive uh, and fish are major predators of amphibian eggs um, so so you know if you take if there's a, a, a pool you know in your yard um, it, every every winter it fills up with water and you're like hey that looks like a great place I'm just gonna dig it a little deeper and put some fish in there and then I can go fishing and and stuff like that you actually are, are um, essentially ruining amphibian habitat when you do that uh, because then it can no longer be utilized by uh you know frogs and and some of the ambistamid salamanders uh, because they need a fish-free environment uh, in order to reproduce uh, the majority of the property in the u.s is privately owned uh, so conservation has to go through private property um, so there's things that you can do just on your uh, own land uh to help species whether and, that, of, and that's instead of having a pool get a pond sure. and even even make a, a smaller little spot in that pond they even have spots that call wetlands that are literally to um, filter your water in the pond itself so then if you can build a little spot that doesn't have the fish in it then that would be good for the amphibians I think that's actually, yeah, that actually makes even more sense. I, I love the pond idea because you can still swim. I mean, <laughs> and it looks so much better than a pool. And it's a lot more relaxing. We make a law that, or try to allocate money towards uh, ponds, people making ponds in their yards. And so that we could, you know, get a, get a little tax write-off. If they can write a jet plane off on their taxes, you should be able to write a pond off on your taxes that could potentially help wildlife. I think so, too. I think that would – if you can write off a jet, you can write off, a you know, a $20,000 pond. I am here today with Nate from – is it like I, I'm? I'm so bad with names, so I'll Nate's perfect. So it's like I can I can get that correctly from a Delaware. He's Delaware's uh, state herpetologist, correct? Yes, uh, Nate Nostrovich. Nate Nostrovich. There's no way I would have gotten that correct. There's a reason why I'm a math guy. Honestly, I, I've talked to other scientists and stuff too. There's a guy with a podcast who does Reptile Fight Club. What he does is he's a disease expert at, in Utah and works for a university out there. And we were talking about it when I was on his show. And scientists do not get paid enough. It's like you're you're a well, sure. in a state, and you had to have a roommate. I mean, there may be other reasons why a roommate, but my God, that's just to me is like, ah, uh, it's like you're not paying us enough. Then, yeah, well, I'd certainly say you know, I didn't choose this career path because of the money. Um, yes, yeah. It's because I'm passionate about it and I care about it, and yeah. really, the money doesn't make a difference. So, so how did you get started? How did you get into a herpetologist? Well, I, I mean, I've always been interested in herps since I was a little kid. Um, you know, I had a mentor, uh, Jim White, who uh, was local, and he kind of brought me along when I was real young, and. Um, it just kind of grew from there. 
Uh, I went to um, University of Georgia for my undergraduate degree. Um, and then back here in Delaware at University of Delaware, I got my, uh, my master's and PhD uh, working with herbs. What, what uh, program did you, did you do during that time? What did you work with? Well, I, I was an ecology major at, at University of Georgia, and then I, I was in the um, wildlife conservation uh, department at uh, University of Delaware. For my master's, I studied population ecology at Eastern Box Turtles. Uh, for a PhD, I basically the same thing, population ecology um, of long-tailed salamanders. Okay. Yeah, I have, uh, I had uh, Jeff Brigler on from Missouri earlier, a couple episodes ago, and I didn't realize how hard it was to breed salamanders. It's a breed salamanders? Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, in, 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 in laboratory settings, uh, it's probably very difficult. You have to have, you know, conditions um, in order to stimulate, uh, you know, breeding. It's pretty, I would say it's pretty hard. Awesome. Um, so let's uh, go ahead with the laws. You actually sent me the collection and sale of native wildlife species. So what are these laws? Uh, so these are, are regulations that are you know, developed by a department. Um, this is going to regulate uh, what native species are allowed to be kept for personal use. Um, uh, basically, there's just a list of, of the species that you're allowed to keep, um, and it's a, a possession limit of one. But you can have one of each species. One of each, that's correct, yes. At, at any time. So where Missouri, it was five of any combination that you wanted – but you could only have five, period. Yeah, every state has has different nuances yeah. to it. Uh, but for, for our our regulation, it's it's one of each. Um, I see a lot of overlap between you guys in Missouri, and that's not necessarily something I would first think of. You know, Delaware and Missouri is quite a ways quite a ways apart. But yeah, well, the species that are on there are um, are most our most common species. Uh, they're the ones that we have the least conservation concern uh, with. You know, obviously you're not allowed to keep any uh, endangered species. Um, yeah. And then other rare species, you know, are excluded from the list as well. And I saw on here, it talked about breeding permits, but it didn't really like, it, it talks about specifying, but I really didn't see a specification right off of hand. Yeah, so honestly, I don't think uh, anyone has ever uh, submitted for a permit to breed in Delaware. Um, that would be something that basically would have to be approved by the director. Um, okay. But to my knowledge, no one's ever, ever done it, so I don't think that this regulation has ever come up. All right, fair enough. So non-native species are, are regulated by a different uh, department, the Department of Ag, uh, and they have some, basically a, a list of species you're allowed to keep without a permit, but then any other non-native herp uh, would require a permit from them. And it's a, a $25 permit. Uh, I don't know too much of the specifics about it because it's in a different department than, than what I'm in. Um, okay. but some of the species we do allow, uh, you know, for example, corn snake is listed as endangered in Delaware. However, we do allow keepers to have corn snakes, uh, so long as they are, um, coloration is not, you know, typical of what a Delaware corn snake would look like. So we know essentially that it was a captive bred species, um, and I can't, I think Department of Ag also is going to require a permit, you know, for you to keep that, a corn snake. Uh, same thing as Red Ear Slider, uh, that requires a permit, and that go, all goes through the Department of Ag, even though we, even though we have Red Ear sli Slider naturalized, 
uh, in the state that all falls under the Department of Ag regulation. And that's 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 interesting. I I mean. It makes more actually worth something in Delaware. You know, I mean, I'm not a big morph guy. So, I mean, for me, I'm also not a big snake guy either. I, I hold them. I'm, I'm not scared of them or anything. I just, I just like lizards. I've got some background besides science. Uh, I've got background in uh, nonverbal human communication studies. So I've used that for the animals. I've got videos where I talk about topics like that. And so, I mean, the, the morphs are just not that interesting. It's more, what is this thing doing? How's it working? So it's, it's interesting that you, you, the morph side of that. But I actually, for the audience in Delaware, this may seem insane, but the talk that we don't have that just literally almost pissed me off the other day when I was at a show and I, it irritates me to no end when people message my quarantine video on my Peter bandits kinks. And they're like, Hey, uh, you need to do exactly this. You need to put them in sand right now. They need to do this. You need to do this. It's like, do you, do you not read the term quarantine? Did you not like, Literally, I'm trying to show you how to do this better for the health of your animal. And something that Jeff Brigler talked about was that uh, it's really a very hard thing for an individual to truly be like against diseases, to fight the diseases. But if you've got local stuff and you're getting in stuff, the diseases that that's easily passed, well why not just go ahead and fix it when you first get the animal instead of waiting and just allowing that poop to get out there into the nature and, you know disease is certainly something we're concerned about with um you know people keeping uh wildlife or and non-native uh species um you know in our regulations if you've held in captivity uh, a native species uh, for more than 30 days, you're not permitted to release it. Uh, and that that is to help protect against disease. Uh, and also, you know, you're not allowed to release any non-native species as well, you know, which is to protect against disease. I think disease is uh, difficult for people to, to grasp because it's not something uh, that you can see. You know, it can be present and you, and you don't know about it. Um, so people don't take those extra precautions um, just because, you know, they, th they think everything is okay, but it's, you have no, no, no knowledge of it unless you specifically test for it. Yeah. And that's, uh, that's things that I try to do with my channel is to push that in a better manner. And now that I understand that, cause I work for chemi chemical companies and stuff. So when I, we have bio bags for things like that. So those things get sealed up. They get sent off specially to where they're not getting into the environment. You at home may go, oh, well, quarantine's not a big deal. But if you don't have some protection there, then the poop gets in the substrate. Well, if you just throw out the, the substrate even by itself, that substrate might have a disease or a parasite or something in it. And then you're literally don't know where that trash is going. So that trash could literally end up somewhere where there is a chance that it could get to the wildlife. So if you just go ahead and fix it now, before putting them in the enclosure, before putting them in the sand, before all of that, you've actually lowered the risk to the outside wildlife. Would you say that's correct? Uh, yeah, I would agree with that. Yeah. And that's a, that's a big thing for me. And it's, I mean, I'm starting to get pissed off because just how easy it is to do this stuff. Like, it's not hard to do a fecal test. It's not hard at all. And so that's very passionate for me. And I get very annoyed at people that are, and so I, I, I've, I've done it so many times. I'm so super calm when somebody tries to attack me over quarantining and stuff that I'm just like, no, no, 
go watch my other video here. Thank you for your feedback. Go watch my fecal video. Try to push them somewhere where they could learn more instead of just attacking them back. Uh, I've been through it too much. And it's, uh, it's incredibly annoying. And I've got lots of friends that have started talking about it. Like I, like a friend of mine the other day was like, I lost two snakes because they got mites and they were babies. And I trusted the breeder. So I was like, okay, we'll just put it in the enclosure because it's a good breeder. You know how easy it is to test for mites? You take a, a baby wipe. If it's got mites on it, you'll see them. It's it's sure, yeah. It's it's not like it's rocket scientists. You don't you don't need to be a rocket scientist. It's so easy. I've had breeders that actually asked me how to do it. I'm like, take a baby wipe. There you go. Like it's it's that easy to test. And so we're we're trying to push this narrative so that we can better save more animals. And then I didn't think about the wild life side of it till I started interviewing you guys. And now that's a big push even further to do this correctly. Cause some people are like, well, they can live with parasites. Yeah. If you have your enclosure properly, they could live with parasites and be fine. But then that parasite has a bigger chance of getting out into the wild. So then that's something that we need to start considering. Am I correct? Well, yeah, and I think, you know, the the stuff that's going on in Florida with the, um, you know, I can't remember exactly what it is, but the parasite that I believe was from uh, Burmese python that is now in um, in in some of the snake species now in, in Florida, uh, the pygmy rattlesnake, I think it's affecting um, to some extent. Yeah, and I just now learned that there is home tests for like Nile viruses and stuff like that from Fish Head Labs, but I don't know how accurate they are. So I can't give my direct perception of them. I just, I know that they exist, but they are like a hundred bucks. And so until I hear back from them and get more data on how, what they're actually have done with it, I can't really give more than that. What are you currently working on? What are some of the projects that you're? Um, well, you know, I work with essentially all reptiles and amphibians in the state of Delaware. Um, primarily, we focus on our SGCN species, which are species of greatest conservation need. Uh, these are species that have been identified in our state wildlife action plan. Um, and so I, I'm folk, you know, we focus on, on those species. It's, it's a lot of, a lot of species actually, uh, probably, uh, 60% of our species, uh, are, are listed as SGCN. Um, you know, but I do do a lot of work with turtles. Uh, we do radio telemetry with bog turtles, uh, and spotted turtles. Um, we do population monitoring for bog turtles, spotted turtles, box turtles, uh, striped mud turtles. Um, we do uh, population monitoring for tiger salamanders and barking tree frogs. Those are two species that are listed as uh, endangered as well. Um, and then we have some some other programs. We're doing a uh, we're com we're compiling a herp atlas. Uh, for the state. Uh, so we're looking to document the distribution of all amphibians and reptiles across the state, uh, just so we can get a better understanding of, of where they are in the state uh, and their, you know, uh, their population status. Uh, and then we have a, some volunteer programs like uh, Operation Terrapin Rescue, uh, which is a project where we have um, a road that's very close to the coast. It borders the uh, Delaware Bay, uh, and there's a lot of erosion occurring there uh, due to uh, sea level rise. Um, yeah. and, and there's traffic that goes through there, and there's been some issues. There's been some, some rocks placed along the road, which has made uh, moving across the road for uh, gravid terrapins uh, more difficult. 
Uh, so we have volunteers uh, that go out there and kind of help the Terrapins uh, move them out of the road so they don't get uh, hit by cars and then help them navigate around the rocks uh, going to and from the bay. Uh, so those are those are probably our the majority of the projects that, that I'm working on. Now this is this is an interesting one because I know that uh, Florida is dealing with the terrapin thing right now. I'm keeping up with that, but because um, usually you don't necessarily want somebody messing with the animals as they're trying to get across the road at least, or maybe brush them because you don't really know if they're going to want to, if they're just basking or if they're, you know, so they're not really wanting to go to that side or that side. So it's, I, I don't know if I should be telling the audience to help the, the Terrapins or contact of you guys first but if if you have the volunteer how does that work like are you training them because your your program talked about them actually even getting trapped into the rocks not just trapped up front because of the rocks but in the rocks themselves yeah so well you know for the for the road issue um you know i would say if a turtle's on the road it, you should move it off uh chances are it's gonna get hit by a car yeah. um so you know the disturbance to the turtle is, is minimal compared to the the impact from from a vehicle um generally you know i move turtles in the direction uh, that they're headed across the road. Sometimes that can be uh, difficult, especially if they're kind of going up the road rather than across it. Um, but you know, you use your best judgment in in some of those situations as to how many of, which direction. How many of those tunnels? Because you guys, I saw the video picture of the tunnel that goes yeah, underneath. So, so, so we, so in order to prevent. Um, further degradation of the road uh, from wave action. Uh, there's been some fairly large boulders uh, that have been stacked up, uh, very large riprap essentially, along the margin of the road. Um, and as terrapins are trying to get from the water to the road, they have to pass by uh, this rock, this rock barrier. Um, because the rocks are so big, there's a lot of holes and gaps that kind of lead down to underneath the, uh, the rock pile. Um, but, you know, we're also dealing with, with tides in this area. So the, the Terrapins trying to get through uh, in high tide, it might be able to make it, you know, a little bit across, but then as that tide recedes, it falls deeper and deeper within within that pile of rocks. And then when the water rises again, it can become trapped uh, and not find a hole or have an appropriate size hole to get back to the surface. So there is potential for drowning. Uh, so in this situation, you know, we ask, ask volunteers to, you know, to check for terrapins in the rocks and pull them out if they find them in there. Uh, they actually uh, can, the terrapins, when they're in there, they're they're swimming around and scratching, trying to crawl up the rocks. So that you can actually hear them uh, more than you can see them. So it, it is pretty easy to get them out and, and locate them and get them out uh, when that situation occurs. Uh, but we did place some some concrete tunnels, which are essentially uh, culverts, you know, that the Department of Transportation would use to put under a road for a stream passage. Uh, we did pass some of those through the rock pile uh, in order to allow, you know, turtles to have a way to get through. Um, but, uh, you know, turtles don't naturally go to, to tunnel openings and stuff like that. So um, they have a little trouble locating them. And they prefer to just to try to get through the rocks, uh, but the, the tunnels are there uh, as a, a means of assistance. Okay. Yeah, I'm wondering, uh, there's a couple of things. So if, if somebody's driving along or just walking along and they, they, they see the turtle on the road, would you suggest at least putting it close to the opening, those tunnel openings that... Yeah, yeah, that's perfectly fine. And, and some of our volunteers uh, do that. Now, also, if they hear that scratching should they call a volunteer call you guys to have a volunteer come out or should they help the turtle themselves like that's 
No, I'd say just go right ahead and 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 you know see if you, if you see a turtle in there and and pull it out. Um, okay. You know if you were to encounter that situation. But we do have so the terrapins um, tend to make their breeding movement at around high tide. Um, so we have essentially a, a volunteer out there every day in the breeding season uh, it, it, it dirt, in a three hour window associated with high tide. And so that runs from the end of May through about the third week of July. You talked uh, on the deal. I thought it said five miles, right, of road. I believe it's two miles. Two miles? Two miles. That's still a lot of road for one person. It is, yeah. Okay. Um, and now there are hot spots. Uh, where the ter where we've noticed the terrapins uh, prefer to try to cross, um, and then there's large stretch stretches where we don't really find any terrapins at all. Yeah, and terrapins are pretty important to keep to keep alive. I guess their numbers are going down or something in Florida. Something's happening in Florida with them, so there's a big fuss over that right now. So they are important. So yeah, so I, I mean, they're an important, an important species to the um, salt marsh community. Uh, their primary prey item is are essentially snails, uh, and those okay. snails, those snails feed on the spartina, the uh, salt marsh grass. Um, so they help keep that um, snail population in check, so you don't have an overgrazing. Of, of Spartina, you know, if you were to lose too much Spartina, that's going to lead to erosion uh, and loss of coastline. So they are an important species to the ecosystem. That's yeah, that's a lot more important than most people would think. Yeah, that's a that's very important because with our coastlines already eroding away, any more faster erosion is just not a good thing. So yeah, I like that. Um, uh, I will link the uh, laws and the volunteer in the description so that anybody that actually wants to volunteer to help the terrapins out can. And yeah, it'd be great. They, yeah, yeah. People can just contact me via my email. Uh, you know, we get you set up on, on how to volunteer. Yeah, that's that's wonderful. Um, so. Do you keep personally, like, do you keep reptiles personally? Because uh, a gentleman that I talked to in Illinois was talking about there's not a lot of herb people, the herpetologists that actually keep. So it's it's a little hard for them to get that connection with the herb society people who actually keep at home. Uh, yeah, I do have some personal, uh, uh, personal herps. Uh, primarily um, animals that I'm using for education. Uh, okay. I, I do I do also teach uh, the herpetology course at University of Delaware, uh, and so those animals are, are primarily kept for that purpose for the teaching aspect of it. I uh, I seen a uh, uh, one of the guys that I watch. He's a really good journalist. Posted this comment that I thought was pretty funny uh, when you're, cause I didn't have this in grade school, but he's like, when you were in grade school and the guy comes with the giant snakes, what was his credentials? It's like, now we, now we're getting to some of the credentials now. <laughs> yeah. I sent that to a few people. I know that actually did that and stuff. And uh, I may actually go out in uh, hopefully uh, Shriners I'm going to see about setting up a show one of these years, hopefully in the next couple of years with Shriners in St. Louis to uh, have a reptile show to raise money for Shriners hospitals. I think that'd be pretty cool. I'd like to see if I could get like an athlete, like if I, if I could get some of the biggest people in the industries that have tagus and retics and things like that, that are, can be super educational for people and have people actually go through the show educational wise and donate and then possibly see if I can get an athlete or somebody that here in St. Louis to actually auction off a tour with them through the, uh, through the show. Like how many thousands of dollars would somebody raise to, uh, to have like Travis Kelsey from the Kansas City Chiefs? Sure. Or, yeah. Or uh, who's the guy from Mad Men? 
because he's actually from St. Louis, the head guy from the show Mad Men. Oh, yeah, he's, yeah, yeah, he's actually from St. Louis. If we could get him to do it, how much would somebody pay to go through a reptile tour with somebody like that? How much money would that bring in for Shriners? I would love that. Like, so yeah, it's it's an interesting concept because education stuff like that, and so often we hear the exact stories that you told that you had reptiles as a kid, you loved them, you you know, and you just went into that. It's something that seems to have a big carryover, and you can't rope me in with anybody. I'm 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 a weirdo. <laughs> so. Uh, so talk about your state conservation. We talked about, you talked about the grass and the snails and the terrapins. What other kind of conservations should we take away? Like notes that we should be taking away from the conservation in Delaware. Well, you know, a lot of the work that I do is, is directly related, you know, to conservation. It's not just going out and finding, you know, herbs and, and documenting where they are. Um, but, but really everything I do is, is targeted towards, you know, how can we, you know, preserve this uh, population or insert, ensure that this population um, remains uh, it, it within the foreseeable future. Um, so there's there's a lot of things you know that go into that, especially from the state side. You know, we do a lot of habitat management uh, where we might. Um, uh, create, you know, vernal pools uh, to uh, to uh, create um, amphibian habitat for breeding. Uh, we may. Um, What's a vernal you know, pool? A oh, vernal pool. Uh, that is uh, essentially it's a seasonal pool. So it's a a, a pond uh, that dries out during some point in the year, generally over the summer. Uh, and it's important for amphibians specifically because most um, or a lot of amphibians prefer to breed in bodies of water that are fishless. Uh, and a vernal pool, you know, is, is just that place. Uh, because it dries out, fish cannot uh, s survive. Uh, and fish are major predators of amphibian eggs. Um, so... So, you know, if you take, if there's a, a, a pool, you know, in your yard, um, every, every winter it fills up with water and you're like, Hey, that looks like a great place. I'm just going to dig it a little deeper and put some fish in there and then I can go fishing and, and stuff like that. You actually are, are, um, essentially ruining amphibian habitat when you do that, uh, because then it can no longer be utilized by, uh, you know, frogs and, and some of the ambistamid salamanders. Uh, because they need a fish-free environment uh, in order to reproduce. I love learning, and that's – I never thought about that. That's really interesting. I like that. Awesome. So we have had – you know, uh, Delaware has um, a very high concentration of vernal pools. Uh, regionally, they're called Delmarva Bays. Uh, farther south, you may have heard them called Carolina Bays. Um, these are just very uh, large – um, you know, circular to oval uh, basins that uh, seasonally will fill with groundwater. There's no stream input or spring input to them. It's just groundwater fed, uh, and they hold water about half half of the year, and then and then dry out. Some of the larger ones may may hold it um, longer, um, but you tend to have a high diversity of amphibians when you have this this habitat. Uh, there has been some um, loss of of this habitat. Um, they're, they used to be federally protected, but they no longer are because they are no longer considered part of the uh, uh, nex nexus of of waterways uh, that are regulated under the Clean Water Act. Um, and historically, you know, a lot of a lot of the farms historically, you know, this was an opportunity for them to create um, a farm pond, essentially. So many of them were, were dug out. Um, others were filled in. Um, but it is an important habitat and it's a habitat that, you know, that we target um, for conservation, you know, in the state. Mm. 
because uh, you were going on about other other conservation. I'm sorry, I stopped you. Yeah, no, I was just I was just you know naming some of the things that we yeah, do. Yeah, no. uh, I was got to habitat management, so we might you know a, a lot of the mowing that we do uh, you know to keep habitats in you know to prevent them from going through succession open canopy habitats are very important uh, to a lot of species particularly turtles uh, this is where they're going to nest uh, so we can't just let everything you know convert back to forest uh, if it were to go unmanaged that that's what would happen everything would grow back up into forest uh, so, you know so we we have fields that are mowed you know they th these fields serve other purposes other than just you know you know it's a great grazing area for deer there's other wildlife that use it but it's also you know from a turtle's perspective you know it's very important habitat to have um, yeah, we do. We um, work with partners, uh, co other conservation partners, uh, you know, to help um, give them guidance uh, on some of their um, conservation efforts as well. Uh, so there's a lot, there's a lot of things uh, that we do. And so, how can other people help with the uh, conservation besides, you know, keeping those pools going and um, those pools without fish? And then uh, your terrapin rescue. What are some of the other things that people can do to help? Well, yeah, you know, I would say um, one, one of the things I would do would be you know get involved with a local uh, nonprofit organization. You know, that's that's conservation oriented. Um, there's going to be a lot of volunteer opportunities and a lot of educational opportunities that you can gain uh, through those organizations. Uh, I know in Delaware. Uh, we have, you know, several groups uh, that do tree plantings. Um, you know, uh, some of the other groups also help with uh, the terrapin conservation. Um, but then you're going to, you know, gain an, an educational aspect from it as well. You know, specific things that you can do on your property. Uh, the majority of the property in the U.S. is privately owned. Uh, so conservation has to go through private property. Um, so there's things that you can do just on your uh, own land uh, to help species. Whether instead and, that, of, and that's instead of having a pool, get a pond, sure. and even even make a, a smaller little spot in that pond. They even have spots that call wetlands that are literally to um, filter your water in the pond itself. So then, if you can build a little spot that doesn't have the fish in it then that would be good for the amphibians i think that's actually yeah that actually makes even more sense i, and I love the pond idea because you can still swim i mean <laughs> and it looks so much better than a pool and it's a lot more relaxing we were talking earlier about the noise from the uh the deal that's why i'm wearing headphones from my fish tanks but i had the fish tank like the electric went out one day and i'm uh, the the de the silence is deafening i don't i mean oh, hey, you're used to yeah. the noise yeah oh yeah it's like it's something like oh my god it's just quiet something's gonna happen it's like it's just like being outside it's that oh it's so eerie and creepy just to be completely silent uh, but now that my neighbors are back in town, I don't have to worry about silence anymore. <laughs> and so, um, what are what are some of the things like when you go to educate people using your your educational animals? What are some of the takeaways from that? How should we be talking to people? What could we possibly do more with that? What are some of the takeaways? All that stuff. Well, I think the important thing, you know, and what I like to do when I use uh, live animals um, in education is is a, a really good tool to to engage people, you know, to get people. Everyone's really interested, you know, it perks their interest a little bit more rather than just standing there talking. Um, so I, th I, I live animals, I think, are an excellent tool um, for education. But what you want to try to do, you know, you want to get people um you want to get them to care about the situation you want to and and then, you know i i'm i can be very passionate about you know conservation and you know when i teach that's one thing that i try to instill upon you know my students is is that passion and importance 
I've noticed that it's really hard for people like you have trolls. You're always going to have trolls, but yet the overwhelming population really do have like, they really do respect people's passions. They might turn around and go like, Oh my God, that guy messes with lizards, but they don't stop talking to me. They actually are more willing to talk to me about reptiles because I'm so passionate about them and because they know I actually care. Whereas like, I, I got friends that are like, I don't, I, they don't like actually uh, keeping captive animals because they have seen so many bad keepers, but they have no issue with me keeping them because I, they know I actually give a shit. Like this is important to me and, you know, taking care of them properly and everything. So uh, the other, I talk about this every now and then, but uh, I do a psychological studies in herbiculture too. So what I've been doing is having people on and actually, and I mean, we're talking about some of the best in the business, like an episode on a guy that befriended a wild fish in Michigan. He actually has a smallmouth bass that comes and sees him when he goes to, uh, to snorkel. And he actually swims right next to him. And it's like, so who are you as a person? And so I'm testing different things like empathy is a big thing that I'm testing. And I didn't realize that that's actually a thing, uh, conservation psychology. I'm not big on the way the lady tested it, the, the, the expert. I think the way I'm testing empathy is a lot better. And like most people are super confused. And I, I interview people that do amazing things that actually care about the animals so much that they go the extra mile. They even do their own podcasts. They try to help people out the best they can. They try to understand people to be able to help them. They don't just, well, this is how it's done. No, they're like, okay, we can talk to you. Let's see where you're at. You know, like the last guy said, meeting them where they're at is an important step. Meeting people where they're at instead of just, and that's something that's completely missed. Like the guy at the show who, who literally watched me sex a Peter Banded skink. There is not that many people in the world that can, that can sex a Peter Banded skink by sight. There's people who actually give me animals who don't believe I can do it. And this guy literally is listening to me talk about it and then later tries to tell me about the care of the animals. And it's like, you didn't pay a single attention because you didn't care where I was at. You just wanted to push, I mean, it's good care. Yeah, but you weren't actually caring about where I was sitting. You just cared about getting making yourself feel better i guess from being right i mean i don't i don't know but um i find that the empathy that these people have is not all the forms of empathy that there's actually multiple forms of empathy so the basic empathy where like every single one of these people can watch an animal and realize that it's not doing well and can fix it can work to fix it because they can actually empathize in that manner, but they struggle to put themselves in the shoes of the animal. So it's, it's quite fascinating to think that, and it's, it's curious. I've still got some more studies to do that I, I want to test, but I'm constantly trying to figure out how we might use that to better educate people. Because it's making them empathize, making them realize that these animals are not mindless, that they actually have thoughts and desires. They're just a lot more basic than ours. It's These are things that I like to, to push. What do you think? Um, I mean, your point about uh, meeting, meeting people where they're at, you know, I 100% agree with. Um, you know, that's that's an approach I, I definitely take, you know, I have to, you know, we field a lot of calls from the public, you know, people have, um, you know, snakes in their house, they might call, uh, to get assistance, um, you know, what to do. Um, you know, and I know a, a lot of, and a lot of people that call me are absolutely terrified of snakes. Um, and, and they don't know what to do and you really have to, you know, respect that. And, um, 
and understand where they're coming from, you know, when you have a conversation with them, uh, because otherwise, you know, they're going to walk away with an attitude, you know, they're going to keep that attitude, you know, that they have, you know, that's the snakes are no good. We should just kill them all type attitude, uh, rather than, you know, potentially, you know, gaining something from it and seeing that there's a, another perspective. Um, you know, if, if you can, if you show that, you know, understanding towards them, you know, they might be willing to take, you know, it's, it's baby steps, essentially a little bit at yeah. a time, but they might be able to like come a little bit closer to you, uh, for, uh, to your perspective, if you take that approach. Yes. I got a guy at work who's Australian and he's just like, the only good snake is a dead snake. That's, that's it. But he actually likes blue tongue skinks and I love skinks. So, I can talk to him all day because because they on his farm in Australia when he was a kid the the blue tongues would eat the snakes so that's why he was big on the blue tongues and stuff so trying to get him to understand those blue tongues I think will eventually start stepping him better into understanding snakes and actually being more accepting of them just because of that overlap of being reptiles hopefully so if he can see the blue tongues is more than just a, a snake eater, I think is appropriate. Would you agree? Yeah. Yeah. What are some of the, the steps that you take to um, just to talk to somebody? Because like uh, there was one show, there was a child who kept uh, talking about venomous. That was like all he wanted to talk about. And I got so annoyed with him. I actually snapped a little bit. Like, I didn't go all full. And it's like, no, I don't care a single thing about damn l venomous. But you see that snake on your finger? Do you see how that snake's, like, behaving? That snake is comfortable on your fingers right now. He's taking in the, the, in the experience of the world from your fingertips. He's, you know, he's comfortable. He's feeling that right now. And that kid just stared at that snake. I'm sure he recognized that I was not happy. But uh, how could I have handled that better? Because I, I didn't like that I snapped. But everybody there is like, <laughs> you, did a, you did a great job. Because that kid did stop saying venomous. And he did take a different look at the snake. You can see it. But still, uh, like, how could I have done better? Well, I mean, I guess so. He was he was saying venomous out of a, a fear perspective, or no. he was just captivated on that word, and you were yeah, venomous, venomous. This kid, my friend, he he, we saw a snake out. We we couldn't tell if it was venomous or not. Venomous, like this is this snake venomous? I know my, my friends at the show, they, they have a good joke where somebody will be holding a snake in their hand and you're talking like a little corn snake or something. Like it's like, and they'll go, is this venomous? And the, my friend will actually go, yes. <laughs> and like, so, no, no, it's not. We wouldn't hand you something venomous. I mean, it's like <laughs> just seeing the look on people's face. But yeah, how, how should we deal with that? Uh, you know, I don't know if I, I if I have a, a a great answer for that. I'm just you know, and you that's know, okay. Like it's, yeah. if we all had an answer, then what's left to find? That's kind sure. of the yeah. Like it's that's the beauty of science. We're always finding new answers. Just from that psychological studies, the stuff that I have found, I'm like, dude, I really thought this would be different. I thought they would have more of the different types of empathy, but that's not showing up. And these are some of the best people in the industry that actually care so much about the animals. So maybe getting people to that point instead of this other type of empathy, being able to work with it like that is, is something there to be able to see that these animals do get sick and they do have, you know, that firing up and firing down is a, is something that we might be able to work with more. What do you think about that? What do you mean that by the firing up? The uh, like an anole where it gets bright green, but then all of a sudden it'll get dark, like you know, bright brown. That's a firing down 
I'm firing up is the changing of the colors. Oh, okay. Um, like, like you, we're using it for what though? To get people to empathize more with the snake or more with the, oh, I the see. animal. Yeah. I... Cause you do more, you've done way more educational stuff than I have. I right. think my yeah. dragons out every now. Yeah, I don't think I would, I don't, I would say I would not probably, you know, yeah, that I, I wouldn't really watch show that on a, on a live individual. Uh, that would be something that you might want to show uh, with video. Um, yeah. You know, so just uh, okay. trying trying to replicate that in in real life. Oh yeah, no, put, no. Put stress on the animal. Okay. Yeah. yeah so, no. Um, no. 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 You you've got a great point. I think I'm yeah. in it more like talking about it. Okay. But yet, yeah, it's a fair point. Like you wouldn't want to do that to where. And I, I think talking about things like that, getting people to recognize that these animals do have some type of emotions. They do have, like, because they don't want to feel sickly. They don't want to feel like they're sick. And I think that's something that we can all relate to. Sure. Yeah. And I think more things like that. How would I, uh, is there a way that I would go about if I wanted to get a law passed in your state? How would I go about that? Well, um, you know, everything that we do through, through the department uh, are, are regulations. And those regulations are, are tied to a statute, which is a, a written law. And, and that stuff is done through the state legislature. Um, so if you want to get, you know, laws changed, uh, you have to contact, you know, your state legislature um, and you know, discuss, discuss issues with them. There's nothing that we, that we can do as a department to get laws changed. Uh, that comes from the people um, contacting legislatures. However, um, you know, a, a good way to, to get laws changed is to have community support. Uh, you know, have like, kind of build like a grassroots type effort um, are, are great ways to, to build support. And if you have, you know, strong support, you know, legislatures, uh, are likely willing to listen. Um, so that would kind of be how, you know, you would, I, I would suggest going about it. Um, you know, building, building support for, for, for what you care about, uh, and then contacting, uh, your legislators and, and having a discussion and and see if if there's ways that they can help. Okay. Uh, when they do pass laws on reptiles and amphibians, does that go across your desk? It does not. Well, I mean, I, I'm certainly made aware of it, um, but it does. It's nothing that I would. Um, it's nothing that I would. Uh, you don't even get a say with. so. I I I, okay. I probably know. I I think that that is is for people high uh, a higher pay grade than me. So would he go across your your director's desk? I guess. And is your director a herpetologist? Um, no, uh, not a herpetologist. Um, but he's you know un understands issues related to wildlife. Um, you know, I don't really know the inner workings of that. Um, it's, it's possible, um, but I, I don't understand the inner workings, so I would not know. See, that's just more knowledge for me that I like, because right. there's always something to learn. And yeah, I mean, grassroots thing, but like I've talked about in some of the other videos, the laws that I would like to see passed are things that are like, okay, you have to take a test before you can get a, you know, a exotic animal, but you only test on things like how to test humidity, how to test te surface temperature versus air temperature, how to surrender your animals, what's uh, how to read a light bulb, the Ferguson zones, things like this that are basic knowledge that is needed, truly needed to do proper husbandry. And so we can actually save more animals and then getting that money from those tests to uh, conservations in the states themselves. But uh, breeders aren't the biggest fans of that, but yet rescues are like, no, it's a have to.
we should absolutely do that. Well, I do believe in Delaware, um, in order to get a permit to, to keep um, a non-native herp, uh, there is a, uh, a visit involved with um, Department of Ag to make sure that you're, um, essentially you have the means to care for it properly and you know the cage is, is adequate and set up adequately. Um, I'm not sure how much, how many visits actually occur, uh, but I, ha I have heard that, that, that they will do visits, um, you know, to make sure um, animals are being treated humanely and kept humanely. So do you guys, so does that lower the amount of rescues that you guys have? I know that's a leading question. I mean, what's the rescue situation there in Delaware then? Uh, well, we do not have any, at least I, I'm not aware of any. Um, there might be people doing it, you know, on the side and, and not permitted to do it. But uh, we do not have any uh, reptile rescue specific uh, organizations in Delaware. There are some nearby in Maryland and Pennsylvania. Um, majority of our surrenders end up with... Uh, wildlife rehabilitators, um, and I do know that they are overburdened with uh, surrenders. Um, okay. You know, they're, they're very passionate about wildlife as well, and, and they are always willing to help when they can, uh, and they go above and beyond to, you know, try and make sure an animal um, that's not being properly cared for you know, c can be taken properly cared for, or an animal that's no longer wanted doesn't get released into the wild, you know, they're willing to take these things. But um, there are not very many of them that take them. And I do know that there is, um, it is a burden on them because they are more interested in helping native wildlife and yeah. rehabilitating native wildlife to get that back out into the wild. Uh, so that kind of takes, it kind of takes away from their resources when they do that. Yeah. Um, so how would somebody might go about starting a rescue in Delaware if they wanted to for reptiles to help out with that cause? Uh, well, I think, uh, you know, I, I think they would just need to apply for uh, permits, you know, get permission from, from our department to, to rescue native wildlife uh, that has been um, kept in captivity. Um, you know, whether that, whether it's been kept legally or illegally, you know, they're going to be, you know, we have both situations occur, you know, they would, so they would, uh, need a permit from us to, to take surrenders in that situation. And then you, I, I imagine that they would need a permit from, uh, department of agriculture as well, um, for the non-native side. Uh, but other than that, I am not aware of any, um, other requirements, um, that would be needed uh, to start a, a, a rescue. That's that's fair enough. I mean, it's a yeah, because that's that's a big thing that's been happening is that rescues have been over overwhelmed pretty much across the country, and it's it costs a lot to run a rescue. So it's so wildlife rehabilitators is another pathway that most people don't recognize to do. Uh, do you know how somebody would go about becoming a wildlife? Because there's there is a difference between a rescue and a wildlife rescue. Right. Yeah. Um, I I do not know specifically. Um, we do have a wildlife rehabilitators council in Delaware. Uh, so you know, it would, I would suggest reaching out to them, and they they would obviously know how to get licensed. You know, properly licensed to be a wildlife rehabilitator. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so how do you guys get your funding? Well, uh, the majority of the funding is, the majority of the funding is, is federal money. Uh, it comes through what's called state wildlife grants. Uh, and that pays for, uh, the work that we do, uh, for herp conservation. Okay. That's, uh, that's what, uh, New, uh, New Hampshire does too. Yeah. I'm, I'm, donations. Do you guys take donations? Uh, we do, uh, 
you can donate on your taxes uh, specifically to Fish and Wildlife. I do not know how that money is allocated, though. Um, the, the money that pays for my program specifically comes from the federal government, and that's something that is basically allocated. You know, when they're doing their the federal budget, uh, they allocate money to the state specifically through the um, the state wildlife grant program. Yeah, if I get to Congress, like I might actually run in 2024. I might because I, I feel like I got to do something more. Like I, I almost ran in 2020 because I was just so sick of the shit. It's like fine, I'll do it myself, but I don't want to. I think I would even have a slogan like, uh, "Fine, I'll go to all." I will go to Washington, fix some shit so I can go the hell home and be left alone. And I think, <laughs> I think the public would respond to that. I think, especially here in Missouri, I think most people would go, yeah, like, no, I I fully agree with you. Yeah, like, no, no, you're my guy. Because you, yeah, no, I recognize that myself. I don't want to be in Washington either. But, no. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, allocating more funds for, you know, conservation stuff. That way you don't have to have a roommate. Like that, that would be nice, right? <laughs> there you go. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, because yeah. So, 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 contacting you know the federal um, uh, Congress person um, to tell them to give more money to to state wildlife departments, um, yeah. you know, is another way that that people can um, aid in conservation. And another thing I could possibly do is actually maybe make a law that or try to allocate money towards uh, ponds people making ponds in their yards and so that we could you know get a, get a little tax write off if they can write a jet plane off on their taxes you should be able to write a pond off on your taxes that could potentially help wildlife. I think so too. I think that would, if you can write off a jet, you can write off a, you know, a $20,000 pond. Yeah. I think that would be fair. Don't you? Yeah. Yeah. That's the, those are ideas that, you know, I didn't think about that till, till just you right now. Like I watched the pond guy and he, I mean, it's lovely, like the stuff that he does. And that's how I understood the wetland parts of it and stuff. Cause I watched that. If I ever get a house, I was automatically, that was something I was going to do. And yeah, actually under Trump, they made a law that actually allows you to write off your jet as a tax write off. So it's actually a law that actually allows that. That's why you see so many people, famous people, rich people riding around on jets more right now because they can ride it off on their taxes. And that's just a big thing that we might be able to do as a culture, change that and add more conservation to society while, and actually ponds might actually help with like, uh, what do you think of reptiles and mental health? Like, just mental any, health uh, of um, oh, people, the animal and the people. Uh, yeah, well, you know, some people, uh, some people, it's it's good for their mental health. I think, especially people who who, who are passionate about reptiles, having having them around, you know, helps them. Yeah. Um, it, but it's not for everybody. That's that's for sure. But the, the, there's that saying, the devil lives in idle hands or something like that. That's kind of how reptiles are because you can't really be idle all the time with reptiles. So therefore, you, you've you got to put in some work. And I think that's actually good for a lot of people's mental health. Yeah. And then, and then you get the positive feedback of seeing the animal do naturalistic behaviors. And the more you know, you see those positive behaviors out of the animal – the more positive it becomes on you because you feel like you've done it. And so the more you want to do it even more. So it's kind of a cycle of positivity. Well, uh, I appreciate you. I don't know if there's a lot more that we can talk about. Anything on your mind? No, I think we covered a lot. Um... Yeah, I got Hydra. He was uh, bouncing around when I came in. For the audience, I just came from work. I came from work early, and he's bouncing around like he was wanting to poop. 
Same thing happened in the last video. Hydra's like, no, I, I want to have to poop, and he, he didn't do it. And it's like, okay, so maybe now he's like, I got to go. So I'll check him out and work with him. So, uh, yeah, I, I appreciate you. Thank you so much. This has actually been helpful. It's given me some new thoughts, some new, you know, contrast to think about. And, uh, yeah, I appreciate it. Well, you're welcome. You have a good week and uh, have a great Christmas. Okay, you as well.